Welcome to the Great Detectives of Old Time Radio. From Boise, Idaho, this is your host, Adam Graham. If you have a comment, email it to me, box13 at greatdetectives.net. Follow us on Twitter at Radio Detectives and become one of our friends on Facebook, facebook.com slash radiodetectives. Well, today typically would mark the start of our listener support campaign. And we're going to do that this year, but in a little bit of a different way. I'll let you in on the details after the program. The original air date on uh, today's episode of Not Beat will play in the meantime is May the 29th, 1950. And this one is Harlan Matthews, Stamp Dealer. Wheaties presents Night Beat. <laughs> On stage tonight from Hollywood, Nightbeat, another in the Wheaties' big parade of exciting half-hour presentations. Night Beat. Hi, this is Randy Stone. I cover the night beat for the Chicago Star. Stories begin in many different ways. This one began and ended with a confession. A confession to the crime of murder. Night Beat, starring Frank Lovejoy as Randy Stone. I have a little boy three years old, and he eats Wheaties without any sugar or cream on them. Just plain, like peanuts. Now, this isn't necessary for you, of course. You can put sugar and milk and fruit on your Wheaties if you want to. But they are good enough to eat plain. They're crisp. They have a nut-like taste. They're all by themselves for flavor. And they give you all their whole wheat goodness in every crispy bite. So if you choose to sit on the back steps eating Wheaties out of the box, it's your very own business. We won't complain. You'll still get that whole wheat and all the nourishment in it. Eat Wheaties any way you like it. But... Eat them often. So good. Wheaties. Breakfast of champions, that is. You can't keep a finger on a city's pulse without having some of its sweat and tears rub off on you. But sometimes the difference between turning a corner or going straight ahead, opening a door or passing it by is all that separates safety from danger, horror from happiness, or life from death. Tonight, the difference lay in whether I should or should not get a shave before starting on my nightly tour of duty. I decided on the shave. Usually, I go to a barber shop on the fifth floor of the Conway building in the heart of the loop. By the time I got there, however, it was after six and the elevator operators had all gone. Two of the lifts were still operating on a self-service basis, so I got in one and pushed the button for the fifth floor. The elevator was almost to the fourth floor level when a sudden yelling drew my attention to the little window in the elevator door. I pressed the emergency stop. A tall, thin-faced man had been lunging at someone out of vision. If there was ever murder on a man's face, it was on his... I saw you talking to the FBI. You told them. I didn't. I was only trying to help you. I brought the elevator down to the floor level without stopping to think what I might be getting myself into. When the doors opened, I saw them rolling around the corridor ahead in a desperate struggle. The tall man was on top, his left hand flailing at the other's face with a briefcase, while with his right, he was trying to drive a long, thin blade into the other's chest. Help! Don't! Holland, please! Hey, drop that knife! The human beanpole saw me coming and scrambled to his feet. So he told you too, huh? He told you. Oh, pal. I'll kill him. Take it easy. Take your hands off me. I'll kill you. He slashed at my face as I threw up my arm. The point of his blade snagged in my sleeve and jerked out of his hands. He darted for the elevator and I ran after him in the best tradition of Frank Merriwell saving the game for dear old Yale. My form may have been all American, but my flying tackle was all wet. His heel caught me in the head and I fell on my face, lost in the stars. I 
you... Are you hurt? Oh, no, no, I'm just stupid. Every time I try to borrow trouble, I always find my credits... Here, let me, let me help you up. Ah, I'm terribly sorry. Oh, thank you, thank you. I'm, I'm all right. How about you? No, he didn't hurt me. Well, he was sure trying. He a friend of yours? Will you come into my office and let me dress that bruise on your cheek? I'm Dr. Riker. Well, I'm Randy Stone. You better give the police a ring right away. That fellow's a maniac. Who is he, anyway? Oh, he's one of my patients. That's my office over there. Oh, one moment. Let's not forget our evidence. This knife he dropped. Well, it isn't a knife. It's a letter opener. He took it off my desk. A letter opener? Mm-hmm. Well, that's different. What was he trying to do? Open you with it? Oh, now, please, come in. I'll, I'll put something on that bruise and try to explain. Thank you. Uh, let's see. A little methyl. It should fix that up. Yeah. Uh, I can't tell you how deeply I appreciate what you did. Oh, oh it was nothing. He was only trying to kill you. Now, will you uh, hold still a moment? There. Yeah. You see, the man is my patient, a disordered personality. Are you an alienist, Doctor? Uh, yes, my field is psychiatry. Well, from what I saw, your patient is more than a disordered personality. He's a homicidal maniac. And I'm Mr. Stone. Well, aren't you going to call the police? Or do I have to? Oh, please. No, what happened was just an accident. An accident? This hole in my sleeve wasn't made by Moore's doctor. He tried to knife me, too, remember? Well, only because he identified you with me. Now, it's not too unusual in a case of this sort for a patient to transfer his persecution complexes against the doctor who is treating him. Oh, yes, but... But uh, what happened tonight is entirely my fault. I was so encouraged over certain other developments that I overlooked the extent of his immediate hysteria. So, uh, what happens if he comes back and kills you? Do you, uh, get a medal? No, he won't try. Not again. I can assure you. But all I ask is that you don't report this incident. To have him arrested would destroy my chances of curing the poor fellow. Now, you won't, will you? Well, oh, uh, okay, Doc. You probably know what you're doing, I hope. Who is he, anyway? What's his name? Ah, uh, now, Mr. Stone. Please. I'm sorry. <laughs> okay, Doc. They say a guy is only as big as the things that annoy him. And he's kind of tough when the annoyance is six feet four and has a knife that makes him even bigger. Well, it just goes to show you. A few seconds earlier, a few seconds later, I'd have gone right up and had a shave from a barber. As it was, I arrived just in time for a close shave at the hands of fate. She was at my elbow again, I guess, when I took the elevator back down into the lobby. Only this time, fate was in the flesh, and a lot of it. Oh, excuse me. Hey, you dropped this here? What? This briefcase. I was cleaning in back when I see you come in. When I come out, this briefcase is lying by the elevator. I just finished cleaning, so I know it's not here before. It's yours. Harlan Matthews. Huh? I, uh, just looking at the name stamped on the leather. No, it isn't mine, but I know whose it is. It's one of Dr. Reichel's patients upstairs. I'll be glad to go up again and bring it to him. Oh, thank you. I'm late finishing here already. <laughs> Harlan Matthews. I'd heard the doctor call him Harlan. It was the same man in the same briefcase he'd been using to bash Dr. Reichel over the head. As the elevator doors opened on the fourth floor, the doors of another elevator slammed shut and started down. I found Dr. Reichel's office locked and the light out. Obviously, he'd just left. I went down to the street level again, but the city had swallowed him up. I looked inside the briefcase contained a heavy album of foreign stamps belonging to Harlan Matthews. A phone book in the corner drugstore showed two numbers for Matthews, his home and his business. I tried his home. Hello? I'd like to speak to Harlan Matthews. Oh, he's not in. Is there any message? Is this Mrs. Matthews? Yes. Your husband left a briefcase in the Conway building. The and Conway I... building? Have, have you seen him there? This isn't Dr. Reichel, is it? No, Mrs. Matthews. My name is Stone. However, I did see your husband at Dr. Reichel's office just a little while ago. Well, I just phoned there. Well, you must have just missed him. Well, where is Harlan now? He's coming home, isn't he? Have you tried his office? Well, there's no answer. Isn't he coming home? Well, that I don't know. Dr. Reichel may be able to tell you. Oh, I've been trying to get him at his home for the last two hours. He never keeps his office open this late. I just called him on the bare chance that he might be there. Oh. Uh, Mrs. Matthews. Why does your husband hate Dr. Reichel? Oh, well, Harlan is sick. He doesn't know what he's saying. Well, then, uh, what does he imagine? I don't know. I don't know. He won't tell me. It's since the war. It's 
something to do with the war, something that happened. I don't know what it is. He's sick. Yes, of course, Mrs. Matthews. Well, I'll drive over with the briefcase. I just called to be sure that somebody'd be home. <laughs> The Matthews lived in a small apartment on the north side. I barely touched the doorbell before I heard her footsteps almost running to open it. Oh. She was a faded little woman just this side of middle age. Behind her in a crib, a baby was crying. Mrs. Matthews, I'm Randy Stone. Uh, the oh, Mr. Stone, I need help. What's wrong, the baby? No, it's Harlan. He just phoned. He's at his office. The way he talks, I think he's going to kill himself. Please, you're a friend of his, aren't you? You've, you've just got to stop him. All right, where's your telephone? Why? Well, the police can get to him a lot quicker than we oh, can. No, no, he warned me that if I sent Dr. Reichel to the police, he'd kill them and himself. Well, okay, then, let's go. Oh, my baby. If we're not too late already. Oh, I can't. I can't. My baby is so sick. I just can't leave her. I can't. All right, Mrs. Matthews, it's all right. You stick here. I'll handle it. Harlan Matthews' business address was a third-floor shop in a third-class shopping district. The dry goods store on the street level was still open for business. Its long awning still hung over the sidewalk in memory of the recent May Day sunshine. The windows above it were all dark except one on the third floor. The lettering on it read, H. Matthews, stamps bought and sold. I climbed two flights to the third-floor landing. The doors of the stamp emporium were half open. Inside, Harlan Matthews was seated at a desk, his thin, bloodless face seeming to stare straight at me. But the light was in his eyes, and I knew he couldn't see too much. Not until I got inside, anyway. Hello, Mr. Matthews. Yes, what is it? I found a briefcase with your name on it. Huh? Well, where is it? Your wife has it. I, I gave it to her. You, you came here just to tell me that? Well, not entirely. Well, I see she... She sent you here. Well, look, Mr. Matthews, you have a... Keep your hands on the desk. Don't do it. Drop it. Drop that gun. Let go. Let go, you fool. I'm using the gun on myself. You're not using it on anybody. Drop it. Drop it. I'll take that. Sorry I had to hurt you, Matthews, but you're a lot better off alive than dead, believe me. Why? So you can arrest me? Arrest you? What makes you think I'm a cop? Don't think I'm so blind that I didn't recognize you when you came in here... You try to jump me at Reichel's office tonight. Waiting out in the car, eh? You think I didn't know what was going on? That Reichel had ratted on me. You've got the doc all wrong. Oh, I have, have I? As if I couldn't see through this stupid act of yours. You and Dr. Reichel trying to help me too, aren't you? All I have to do is talk, don't I? Just relax and talk. Well, what would you like to hear? Look, friend, you don't have to tell me a thing. Yes, why repeat what you know already? Dr. Reichel's already told you everything I ever confided in him. What do you want, a written confession that I shot Captain Claney in the back? Well, I did. Write it down. I'll sign it. Is that what you want? If you don't mind, Details? I... You like details? Look, I... May 6, 1943, two days before we took Tunis, out in patrol. Write it down. I hated him. He was a lousy dog, arrogant, insulting. All right, there it is. Motive, time, place, everything. You satisfied? No, I'm just tired. If you feel like talking, talk to the police, not me. I never saw either you or Dr. Reichel before tonight. My name is Stone. I'm with the star. If you doubt it, pick up the phone and find out. The papers? Reichel told the papers? Well, you get this into your head and you'll have it in a nutshell. Reichel never told anybody. All I know is what you've just spouted. Me? You sit here like a broken down ham, dramatizing yourself, dreaming up things that never happened, uh, making like a martyr, feeling sorry for yourself, well, I... leaving your wife at home worried sick about you. You've got a family to think of. Well, now, go on I... and get your coat. I'm taking you home. Uh, all right, I guess maybe you're right. I've been acting like a fool, haven't I? I'm sorry. You'll feel lots better in the morning, Mr. Matthews. Now, come on, let's go. Yeah, I'll put things away first. Uh, may I have my gun? You better let me keep it for a while. Oh, you don't have to worry, Mr. Stone. Not anymore. This note on the table, I was writing it to my wife when you arrived, telling her goodbye. Well, I've changed my mind about dying. Well, we all have our bad days. Shall we go? Yeah. Uh, my gun, please. Oh, well, it's all right, really. Well, okay. Here, I've taken out the cartridges. Souvenirs, you know. Thank you. I'll, I'll put away these catalogs. Uh, would you mind closing that window for me? I walked over to the big window facing the street. It was wide open from the bottom. 
I reached up to close it just as a soft footstep sounded close behind me. Why not? And Matthews me. pushed me over the sill toward the street below. General Mills is bringing you Nightbeat, starring Frank Lovejoy as Randy Stone. You know, this talk about breakfast of champions is the real thing. Jackie Robinson does eat Wheaties. So does Tommy Henrik. So does Mel Parnell. So does Bob Feller. And so does a gentleman named Mr. V.O. Hill, 1445 Massachusetts Avenue Northwest in Washington, D.C. Now, Mr. Hill is not a nationally famous figure, but he is a champion just the same. On January 7th of this year, he was playing golf at the Rock Creek course. At the 11th hole, Mr. Hill made a 148-yard drive against a pretty stiff wind and made a hole in one. (laughs) You think he wasn't a champion for a while there? Brother. And I'm standing here telling you Mr. Hill eats Sweeties. He does. Says he eats them regularly. They're whole wheat, you know. There's a lot of energy in whole wheat. Is the kind of energy you need, whether you're dealing with a baseball bat or a golf club or a vacuum cleaner. Get your Wheaties come breakfast time and see if you don't have a better morning. Wheaties, milk, fruit. Breakfast of champions. It's for you, too. And now, back to Nightbeat and Randy Stone. Life, they say, is a continual process of getting used to things we hadn't expected. Like, for instance, getting pushed out of a guy's office window. I hadn't figured Harlan Matthews was that far off the beam, but that, of course, was my fault. From a character as neurotic as Matthews, I should have expected anything. I guess I was out more than a couple of minutes because when I came to, a cop had evidently just arrived on the scene. Voices crowded through my head against a backdrop of pain. I stared up at the moon shining brightly through a huge rip in the awning, and I tried to push myself up to a sitting position. And the cop bent over. Yes, and how easy. I'll call an ambulance. Wait a minute, wait a minute. Get Matthews. Who? Harlan Matthews, stamp dealer, third floor. He pushed me. Matthews, huh? Just wait here. I took inventory of my legs and arms and found them in usable condition. I climbed on my feet. People crowded around, their voices blending in an unintelligible jumble of questions. I staggered through them toward the cab. Their faces swarmed about me, white and staring like faces in a nightmare. I reached out, found the door handle of my car. I opened it and got in. I sat there for a while, trying to reassemble my wits. My head throbbed with pain and my mouth was dry. I wanted a cold drink more than anything I could think of. So I found my keys and drove to the first drugstore I came to. It was the sight of the phone that made me remember Mrs. Matthews. She'd be anxious to know what happened. I had to tell her something. I rang her number. Hello? Mrs. Matthews, it's Randy Stone. What happened? He didn't... No, 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 I got there in time. Oh, thank God. Where is he? Well, I thought he'd be home by now. Not long ago. Well, when you left him, was he all right? Oh, yeah, he was just swell. You ought to see me. What? I'll tell you what. I'll call Dr. Reichel right now and tell him the situation. He should be... Oh, I got a call from Dr. Reichel just a little while ago. Yeah? That is, it came through a message service. They want Harlan to call Dr. Reichel right away. I called the doctor's office to find out why, but the doctor's not there. He's not at home either. Well, why does Reichel want to see him? Didn't they tell you? No. The message just said that it was... Very important. I invested another nickel in the call to Dr. Reichel's office. There was no answer, so I sat down at the counter and had a cup of coffee. I felt somewhat better by now, although my head still throbbed and I still found it hard to unscramble my thoughts. I went back to the phone booth and called Dr. Reichel's home. Perhaps he'd return by now. Oh, what is it, please? Dr. Reichel, residence. Has Dr. Reichel come in yet? No. No, Dr. Reichel, not here now. Uh, look, uh, has there been anybody at the house to see him within the last hour or so? No, no. No visitor. Too late. You call tomorrow, maybe. Yes? Mm. Goodbye. I checked with Mrs. Matthews once again to see if Matthews had returned yet. He was still missing. 
However, since my last call, the police have dropped in. They wanted to talk to him about pushing someone out of a window. Someone who'd driven away from the scene without leaving his name, address, or license number. You were with him, Mr. Stone. He couldn't have done it. Oh, yes. Utterly fantastic. Uh, You'd better try to get some sleep, Mrs. Matthews. I'll ring you if I locate him. Good night. I headed out toward Dr. Reichel's residence on the northwest side, wondering just how foolish I was not to send the police out instead. Matthews did more than just pass from mania to depression. He'd made the round trip. The doc had been looking for him, but now he could be looking for the doc. I stepped on the gas. It was quite a drive to Dr. Reichel's home. When I got there, it turned out to be a sizable estate with an impressive driveway turning through the moonlit grounds. The dark hulk of a battered sedan stood parked near the head of the walk that led to the veranda steps. I pulled up behind it. I got out, and I gave it the once-over. I touched the top of the radiator. It was still warm. A parade of maples lined the paved walk. Ahead, the house stood dark and still. I lifted my hand to the doorbell. Don't. Well, hello, Matthews. Kind of thought you might be around. What are you doing here, Mr. Stone? Uh, When I hit the pavement, I kept bouncing until I finally landed out here. I hardly expected to find you quite the same as when I left you. Oh, I'm not. I'm smarter. Next time I get that gun you're holding, I'll know enough not to give it back to you. Next time? There isn't going to be a next time, Mr. Stone. Not for you or for your confederate, the doctor. Oh, yeah, of course. Uh, you could be faking. I took the cartridges out of that thing once. Yeah, so you did. I might have forgotten to reload it. Why don't you try to take it away from me and find out? Well, come on. Is it loaded or isn't it? Make me show you. Well, uh, if I did, it might arouse the neighborhood, don't you think? You might not be able to hang around here waiting for Dr. Reichel. Yes, Mr. Stone, I've already thought of that, or you'd have been dead by now. Unless, of course, the gun isn't loaded. I'm willing to let you force me to show you. All you have to do is take one step toward me, just one step, Mr. Stone. One single step, and you'll know the answer. Before I do, maybe you could give me some other answers. Answers to a few things I still don't understand. Indeed? What, for instance? Oh, for one thing, I still don't understand just what good it'll do you to kill either Dr. Reichel or me. You know the answer to that, you and him both. I wish I did. He said he was my friend. That it would help me if I talked, so I told him. Then I saw him talking to the FBI man at the federal building, and I knew I'd made a mistake, that he betrayed me. If he had, would you be free now? Figure it out. I have. They're just waiting to round up some witnesses who saw me shoot Captain Claney. You're wrong, Matthews. You're dead wrong. Reichel hasn't told anyone, anyone at all, and he never will. Same goes for me. I only wish to heaven that were true, because if it were, I'd never have a better reason for killing you than now before you do have a chance to talk. But unfortunately, I'll never be sure that you haven't talked. Well, kill me, there's one thing you can be sure of, star billing in an execution party. Really? But right now, it's you who are the star, Mr. Stone. Or maybe this gun isn't really loaded after all. Come on, find out. Give me an excuse for pulling the trigger. There he comes. Back against the wall. Stay where you are. Right there. A cold wind rustled the maples as the big car came to a halt at the head of the drive. Hidden by the trees, its lights blinked out. By the veranda rail, a dozen feet away, Matthews crouched, gun raised. The trees hid whoever it was coming up the walk as the moonlight and shadow danced among the leaves. Come on, Michael, come on. Keep coming. Come on. Matthews. A little closer. A little closer. In another moment or two, his target will be out of the shadow of the trees into the bright moonlight. Matthews. Huh? Uh, Those men with him. Who? Uh, Hiding among the trees. See? They're moving. Where? Where? There. Huh? That shadow there. And oh, over there. And oh. over there. Can't you see them? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. They're covering him. He knows you're here. Oh, kill him. They'll get you first. You haven't a chance. No, no, no. Drop that gun. Drop it. They'll never get me. Never, never. <laughs> He thrust the gun to his own head and pulled the trigger six times before I ever got to it. They'll never get me! Nobody! But, Mr. Stone... 
Stone. You mean he was trying to ambush me with an empty gun? Yes, Doctor. Then he tried to blow out his brains with it. Oh, poor fellow. Looks to me like he's gone off his trolley, but for good. Look at him lying there, groveling in the dirt, as though he were trying to hide. Oh, dig himself in. Yes, he's living a moment of the war all over again. Harlan, stop it. Stop it. Genusia, May 6, 1943. But, well, how did you know? He told me. I guess Captain Claney got his revenge after all. What do you mean? Well, he shot Claney in the back and thought he got away with it, but look at him now. Oh, Mr. Stone. This whole nightmare in the poor fellow's mind started when he observed me making an inquiry at Army Information Headquarters here. I was trying to locate the one man who could cure him. Who? I, Captain Willard Claney, of course. What's that? But the reason I arrived here so late is that I've been wandering about looking for Matthews. I wanted to tell him that I finally succeeded. I found Claney. You mean that... The man's alive and well working in a bank in Spokane. I spoke to him tonight on long distance. Well, well, that's one for the book. Matthews must have just wounded him and then thought that he... Matthews didn't even hit him. He didn't hit him? Doctor. Doctor. Wait a minute. Harlan. I think he's in there. Harlan. Do you hear me? Doctor. Doctor Riker. Did you hear what I said? Captain Claney is alive. You didn't kill him. Do you understand? You did not kill him. You're lying. No, I can prove it to you. Now, we can call him up. You can speak to him yourself. He's alive. No, I shot him. I shot him. You thought you shot him, Harlan, but you missed. You missed. No, no, I saw him drop. I saw him, and he dropped. Oh, yes. Claim he dropped all right, but not from your bullet. No. When I spoke to him on the phone tonight, he said that the only wound he received was a shell splinter in the chest... Why, he doesn't even remember a sergeant named Harlan Matthews. What? You're joking. No, Harlan, it's the truth. I didn't kill him. I didn't kill him. (laughs) Know the truth, and the truth shall set you free, huh, Doc? Well, for him, there's still a long, hard road ahead and plenty of work to do. But at least, Mr. Stone, we've reached the beginning. Well, dawn is just around the corner and the city lights are going out street by street like the lights in some people's minds. Yes, they say the truth is a great mental healer. And I guess it is, if you can bear to face it. (laughs) Okay, so let's face it. Copy, boy. You are listening to Nightbeat on the Wheaties' Big Parade. Whole wheat. Flakes of golden whole wheat. Sounds pretty good just like that, doesn't it? Everybody knows you need whole wheat, and Wheaties make a very nice way to get it. Breakfast time, lunch time, any time is the time for Wheaties. Easy, too. Just open the package, pour those flaky little flakes into a bowl, sugar them, cream them, and be happy. That's Wheaties you're eating. Breakfast of champions. Wheaties. Get some. Night Beat, starring Frank Lovejoy, is produced and directed by Warren Lewis and edited by Larry Marcus. Tonight's story was written by Erwin Ashkenazi with music by Frank Worth. The part of Harlan Matthews was played by Jeff Corey. Jeanette Nolan was Mrs. Matthews and the doctor, Ben Wright. Listen next week at the same time and every week as Randy Stone searches through the city for the strange stories waiting for him in the darkness. And this is your Wheaties man, Frank Martin, inviting you to listen also on Tuesday, that's tomorrow night, to the premiere of the Penny Singleton Show on the Wheaties Big Parade. See you then. Going to bake a pie sometime soon? Make it with Crust Quick, the Betty Crocker Pie Crust Mix. You know, it's a tender, flaky crust that's at the bottom of every delicious pie, sure as you use Crust Quick, and so easy. Just add water to Crust Quick. Mmm, and what pie crust? Tender crust, tasty crust, rich, short, lovely crust, just like Betty Crocker makes. And you can make it. Just add water to Crust Quick. Crust Quick, the Betty Crocker Pie Crust Mix. Nightbeat, 
came to you from Hollywood. Stay tuned for Christopher London over most NBC stations. This is Andrew from otrwesterns.com. I wanted to invite you to come take a look at our site where we put out podcasts of old-time radio westerns. Check us out at otrwesterns.com. You're listening to The Great Detectives of Old-Time Radio with Adam Graham. Now let's get back into the show. Welcome back. Well, another surprising tale... And this one, uh, touching on the idea of what we now call a post-traumatic stress disorder with some pretty severe symptoms. The one scene that uh, was probably Randy's most ill-advised move this whole series, including when he uh, went to avenge the murder of Ted Carter and the pilot, was handing the gun back to that guy. And then turning his back on him. If you're skeptical, don't give him the gun. Really not all that complicated. Joey uh, comments uh, regarding episode 2115, The Night Watchman, that that was a very sad story. And I think you could say that of um, most of the recent stories. This one is the happiest one, and I guess that does say something. All right, well... And now we're going to have a few words about the listener support campaign. And I start with some history. When I first uh, started the program, I hoped that we would be able to get regular sponsors, as it happened with the old time Dragnet series. Well, that didn't last long. We were without a sponsor, and we also had some escalating uh, cost. And I'd added a donation link, but uh, really I'll added the listener support campaign to give people a chance to directly help out with the cost and defraying some of the expensive time and labor that uh, goes into the program and solicited one-time donations. And essentially, the cash flow from the show followed a pretty uh, predictable pattern. It would drop off in certain months, January, February, June, July, and the first part of um, August, and then we'd have listener support campaigns and get a you know, uh, infusion of funds until the next listener support campaign. And we put a big emphasis on it, mentioning different items and asking uh, for donations both before and after the program. And I've always been gratified by all the folks who sent in those donations uh, to help support and continue work we're doing here with the program. Even though, in many ways, it wasn't my favorite thing to do. However, over recent years, things have kind of changed a little bit. Last year, we started up a Patreon. I should say 2015, we started uh, to pay a Patreon, and we began to add a lot of Patreon supporters. We now have more than 100 uh, supporters, given between two and thirty dollars per month. While it's not one of the uh, giant Patreon accounts, that level of support gives us reliable month in and month out uh, income. So it's not so crash and burn on the uh, listener support campaigns. In addition, and this is big, we do actually have a couple of sponsors in Audible and Blue Apron. Now, you've not heard a Blue Apron uh, ad for a while, but uh, don't fear after uh, being a weekly sponsor in January, uh, we'll be doing one ad per month, essentially, and uh, we'll hear from them again in uh, March. So I'm going to, based on just the change situation, uh, do be a, a little bit more low-key in this listener support campaign. Uh, all of the campaign offers still apply. And the only thing that we'll be adding, I'll, I'll get to it in a second. You can support the show on a one-time basis, support.greatdetectives.net. We welcome those one-time donations. Uh, you can become a Patreon supporter at patreon.greatdetectives.net. During the listener support campaign, uh, for donation of $20 or more, we'll send you an 
uh, a free ebook and an additional thank you gift of your choice. And the available thank you gifts are all at support.greatdetectives.net. The only thing that is new to this year's campaign is I've added uh, Kindle book versions of the Who is Johnny Dollar Matter. You can get it in paperback for a donation of $100 or more, or you can get the Kindle version for $50 or more. Everything else is exactly as it has been. The variety of classic movies, audiobooks, audio dramas, with Sherlock Holmes, Perry Mason, and uh, much more. These are things that in one form or another I've enjoyed and I would love to uh, send them along to you as a thank you gift so that you can enjoy them too. And in the case of uh, many of the audio dramas, I'm pleased to uh, help do a little bit to help out and promote some of the great modern audio drama companies out there, such as uh, Colonial Radio Theater and uh, Jim French Productions, by introducing folks to some of their work. So you can uh, view a full list at support.greatdetectives.net, but that's going to be as detailed as it gets, and we'll see how things go this year. All right, that'll be it for today. Uh, if you do have a comment, send it to me, box13 at greatdetectives.net. Follow us on Twitter at Radio Detect.